This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Hey hey, Marcus House with you here, and there has certainly been no shortage of space news again over the last week. Starship updates screaming along as always with the massive blue crane starting construction on the new high bay for the super heavy booster. An interesting development with the UK government looking to be partially funding OneWeb after it seemed earlier this year that there was no real chance left for the company. We have of course another beautiful Starlink launch coming very shortly, which will be another rideshare mission. A few interesting updates updates from Boeing Starliner, and sadly Rocket Lab had a launch failure on the last flight after 11 consecutive successful orbital launches, and are currently busy diagnosing the data to find out what exactly went wrong. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Another week of progress at Boca Chica saw the delivery to the launch site of Raptor SN27. As we see here, a shiny new Raptor was standing by awaiting installation and ultimate glory. Could this be the one to do the 150 meter test flight? With the Raptor finally squared away underneath SN5, we now await the all important static fire and hop test. And we see here in a sign of pending activity, the flare stack stirring to life once again. So as preparations continue, with SN5, we still have a hive of activity around the launch site, from measuring equipment installations to an assortment of earthworks. Back at the construction site, it's more nose cone ring segments and domes. The SN6 prototype is looking awfully lonely here in the mid bay, so we're looking forward to the next full stack prototype to join in. Do you think that that will have a nose cone and aerodynamic surfaces this time? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Now, high bay construction also started this week, and it's taking shape as we see here. I have the feeling just by looking at the scale of the wall segments that this is going to be built so fast our heads are going to spin. I can't wait to see this massive structure completed. The massive size of the crane alone at full extension just gives us an idea of what heights a stacked super heavy booster will reach. It's just mind blowing and keep this in mind when you see the aerial footage here by RGV aerial photography and just how big that huge crane looks even from the air. We can also see a good view of the wall segments going up rapidly now. RGV also captured what is claimed to be the first ever aerial photo showing the SpaceX Boca Chica launch site as well as the build site all in the same shot. This incredible shot shows that massive crane tower and just take a look at the size of it at this distance away. This really does put it into perspective from another angle. Now if you're interested in supporting RGV aerial photography and their work head to their Patreon page which all helps to fund these spectacular flights. While we're talking about this gigantic crane, this beautiful shot here gives us a close up and personal view of just how tall this monster can stretch. Just massive, and this particular beast can lift up to 750 metric tons. Interestingly, Mary there also grabbed some interesting footage of the old SN3 section looking to be getting scrapped. This section was from this beast here that just folded in half a few months back. It seemed like SpaceX were trying to do something with that lower part that was still left over. I've been wondering for a long time what the intention was with that section. It looks like they've finally decided to put it to rest now though. Now Zeus, the Boston Dynamics robot dog here that SpaceX recently adopted to inspect dangerous areas of the site during and after testing, was spotted at its doghouse being worked on here by the team. These little puppies can do some incredible stuff, so it will be well worth the investment, I'm sure. And more recently, the mass simulator has been installed on the top of SN5 to simulate the weight of a nose cone and other components that will be required for a more extensive future flight. This this may not look like it's heavy, but that steel box, if it's anything like the last one, has a few steel rolls inside it which are around 10 tons each. So yes, the entire mass simulator there would be somewhere between 20 tons and 25 tons or so. This all means we are getting very close now to a static fire test, and with any luck, that 150 meter hop test. As always, a huge thanks to Mary, aka Boca Chica Girl, with NASA Spaceflight for capturing all of this historical footage. Amazing work as always. You can see all their content here on their channel first, so check that out. Now, if you want to know more about what process the Starship will go through for static fire tests of the Starship prior to flight, I talk more about that in depth in this video. While you're here, of course, please do consider subscribing and taking a quick second to tap that like button. There is loads more news coming with Crew Dragon's return and Starlink, and I'd love to share all that with you.
Now we talked a little about OneWeb back in March when they were considering filing for bankruptcy protection as it dealt with the economic issues that were well underway at that point, along with of course the huge competition coming in from SpaceX's Starlink network. Now they had actually filed for bankruptcy protection in March after it was unable to secure financing. At the time they had only just launched 35 satellites into orbit on the Soyuz, which seemed a strange thing to do at the time considering the financial issues. What has been a very strange turn though is that the UK government look to be investing $500 million to become a massive shareholder in OneWeb, which to be honest has the whole space community scratching their heads a little trying to determine why. Now similar to Starlink, OneWeb's mission is to create a sophisticated broadband satellite network. Really they have been the only real competition to Starlink that was actually launching similar infrastructure into space. The problem of course is that SpaceX certainly has a huge edge with the cost of launching mass to orbit. One would assume SpaceX is launching Starlink satellites at near cost price and now even providing ride shares on top of the Starlink satellites to make it even cheaper for themselves. Now this makes it pretty hard to beat from a launch cost point of view. Anyway, the new deal with the UK which essentially is around a 20% share of the company should allow OneWeb to continue building out the complete construction of the satellite constellation that is planned to beam internet connectivity to ground terminals from the Earth's surface. From memory the total number of satellites that they had planned was around 650. Now Starlink having well over 500 already in orbit gives them a very large head start. OneWeb does seem to be targeting the polar regions better than what SpaceX can cover with their inclinations all at 53 degrees, but at some point SpaceX may still cover these regions as well as the network expands. So far OneWeb just has the 74 satellites in total in orbit. Now a number of people have speculated that a reason for the UK to be going into this is due to their recent lost access to the European Union's Galileo space system a few years back as it broke away from the EU. Now other people seem hell bent on pushing the idea that they will use OneWeb's network for GPS which is just far beyond the realms of possibility. For a start the satellites don't include the necessary hardware for that job. In my mind there is really no reason that I've read up on that really makes a great deal of sense as to why the UK is doing this. So if you've got any thoughts or interesting theories around this let me know in the comments below. Now while we're talking a little about GPS just a quick side note about the recent SpaceX GPS3 launch. Last Saturday we saw the booster return to port on the deck of Just Read the Instructions. It was quite cool to see that the booster was looking so clean upon arrival, this of course being a brand new booster for this flight. Now after the massive crane in port was connected to the booster, the SpaceX crew started lifting the landing legs which is something we are all getting quite used to seeing. But when the crew had lifted one of the legs, a retraction cable snapped and the leg came thundering back down onto the deck. Luckily no one was injured but I imagine it must have been a pretty scary situation. So scary in fact this dude's hard hat fell right off his head causing a secondary smaller hazard to deal with. Now shortly afterward the crew lifted the leg again slightly to inspect the damage. There didn't seem to be anything too badly wrong with the leg itself and as far as we know there were no other issues. So yes that was a little more eventful than expected. The latest Rocket Lab Electron launch took place on the 4th of July dubbed PIX or it didn't happen. This launch occurred just three weeks after the successful mission Don't Stop Me Now and signified the quickest launch turnaround to date. This gives us a solid indication that Rocket Lab are progressing well to achieving their ultimate goal of one launch per week. Now here we can see some footage of the vehicle integration team preparing the first stage segment for shipment to the launch site. The team are currently completing a launch vehicle every 18 days or so and work also continues to advance nicely behind the scenes for an eventual first capture attempt of the Electron booster stage using a helicopter. Currently this first mid-air capture attempt is thought to be coming up around Flight 17. Launch 13's mission name PIX or it didn't happen was referring to all seven payload satellites being Earth imaging satellites. Now as we see here the countdown progressed successfully to zero and the Electron roared off the pad. Now for a small rocket the noise from this is still quite surprising. I really enjoy watching Rocket Lab launches for many reasons and I have to say one of them is the footage. It's just beautiful every time. Some fantastic visions here as Electron's ascent progressed and check out the footage here at Max Q as it punched through that barrier on its climb out of the Earth's gravity well. Just look at that thing go. 
onward to the main engine cutoff with that beautiful stage separation with the second stage roaring away. As we can see in the upper right of the screen, the speed and altitude readouts were looking great shortly after we saw the fairings jettison with all telemetry reporting nominal. Then things take a turn for the worse. Around 20 seconds or so before the normal battery hot swap, we lose video from the second stage just before the six minute mark into the mission. At this point, we know something is not quite right. If we look again to the upper right of the screen, the speed and altitude data has changed drastically with the altitude taking an almost instant reversal. At this point, the stream changes to a vision of mission control. At what would have been orbital insertion at 540 seconds, we still had this footage of mission control and no further sights or information of progress. The stream was really then quite rapidly concluded shortly thereafter. Sadly, it was confirmed later that Launch 13 failed to make it to orbit as we see here in some tweets between Elon Musk and Peter Beck. Seeing Peter here sincerely apologising for the payload losses is actually quite hard to watch. It was obviously a very tough day for Rocket Lab. Now with data analysis underway rapidly after the launch anomaly, Rocket Lab will of course determine what happened here and move on to more success into the future. More recently, Peter Beck announced that Rocket Lab are quickly making progress into the anomaly and that it had been incredibly humbling to see so much support and kind words from the whole community. So yes, chin up guys, you are doing an amazing job and all support the incredible work you are doing and have already done to get to where you are today. You'll come out with a much better rocket after all of this. Now the Starlink launch that was scheduled during the week has been cancelled with SpaceX tweeting out just prior to the launch saying that they are standing down for today's mission due to weather. Now they tweeted out afterwards that the launch is now targeting Saturday the 11th of July at 10.54am which of course pushed it back just far enough to sit just after this video is published so sadly we don't have any footage of that today as we were hoping for. This mission though is going to have 57 Starlink satellites instead of the usual 60 and this is because it will be another Starlink rideshare mission. This being the second rideshare mission which will be including on board two of Black Sky's satellites which sit right up on top of the stack of Starlink satellites. We'll be looking forward to that booster drone ship landing as always on the drone ship Of Course I Still Love You which will be stationed roughly 630 or so kilometers downrange. This booster designated B1051 has already flown previously four times, twice in 2019 with Crew Dragon's Demo 1 mission and the Radarsat mission and two other Starlink missions this year. So yes, this should be another amazing fifth flight. We're looking forward to a record-breaking sixth flight for one of these boosters very soon. Now while on the topic of Starlink we spotted this awesome render by 3D artist Bart Cardwell from the Twitter account Neopork85 around the 4th of July and I just think this gives us a very real idea just how big the Starship payload bay will be. Now just check this out. If we place the Falcon 9 fairing inside the Starship cargo area there is plenty of room to move. In fact if we reference that in scale of a human that gives us an even better idea. Now the Starlink satellites themselves are actually quite large and cramming 60 of them into that fairing is a big ask alone. But SpaceX do it and they do it very successfully as we've seen now repeatedly. Now imagine if SpaceX in the future could cram an entire Starship full of them. Well, who's to say they won't? And indeed it could look something a little like this. This is a render of the Starship in orbit with 400 Starlink satellites crammed into the payload bay. Just check that out. Now be sure to go and follow there on Twitter as well to catch up on new renders dropping there. Just unreal work, I can't get enough of this community of creators. Now a quick update on Boeing Starliner. NASA announced during the week that they would be providing an update on the commercial crew program's close call with the orbital test flight of Starliner back in December. We'll talk more about that shortly but just before that this video is sponsored by Brilliant who have been incredible supporters of my channel. In more recent years we've seen a big increase in the number of people learning online and doing away with outdated forms of educational content. There are loads of people searching for great online math and science resources right now. Now, and if you're one of those people, look no further than Brilliant. If you are a professional brushing up on the latest topics, a student looking to get ahead, or someone who just wants to learn new information and understand what makes the universe tick, you should check out this incredible content. 
every time I come back here and jump through the courses, I find something new and amazing to learn more about. In this Mathematical Fundamentals course, you'll find all the essential tools for mastering algebra, logic, and number theory. The best thing about this material is that it isn't about memorizing formulas. It's about problem solving. It's about looking at patterns and predicting the future of those patterns. Working with these principles in a visual way like this, instead of a bunch of symbols, really does help to make the idea stick. Once you understand the why behind these mathematical principles, you might be surprised how that understanding changes your perspective on the material. If you are naturally curious and you want to build your problem solving skills, then get Brilliant Premium to learn something new every day. Huge thanks go to Brilliant for their support of my channel here. And if you would like to help support me and would like to give it a try, head to brilliant.org slash Marcus House. The first 200 people will get 20% off the first year of Brilliant Premium. The link is in the description below. So yes, as you've more than likely heard, seeing as it's quite old news now, Boeing's test flight back in December ran into a number of problems with their launch test that required it to abort its mission to the International Space Station and do a rapid return of the Starliner capsule much sooner than planned. Now, although these issues had occurred, Boeing was still able to complete a number of the test objectives during that mission. In March, of course, NASA and Boeing went through a joint independent review of these issues that occurred on the test flight and many of those actions that were recommended are already underway. As stated here on this news update just a few days ago, NASA can't stress enough how committed the Boeing team has been throughout this process. There is a lot more work ahead, but work already completed has made significant steps to help NASA's commercial crew program move forward on the path towards resuming flight tests with Boeing Starliner. We were hoping that there would be a rough date set with this release, but as it currently stands, Boeing and NASA have not yet established a launch date for orbital flight. Flight Test 2. Interestingly, at the end of July, Boeing published a video here showing them putting the Starliner parachutes to the test at White Sands Space Harbor to prove the spacecraft's landing system performance well in case of an abort with a simulated main parachute failure. Now, as stated in the video description, this test was part of a supplemental campaign designed by Boeing and NASA to build more reliability into the Starliner vehicle. During regular landing, Starliner is designed to deploy two drogue chutes and three main parachutes. Within this test, they deliberately simulated one of those main parachutes failing. Now, if you recall, back when the Starliner went through the pad abort test, the third main parachute actually failed to deploy anyway. Now, I'm not sure if that raised specific concerns that required this specific test or not. It could be completely unrelated, but it seems interesting this test seemed to reproduce that failure in a very similar way. Since all this began, of course, the Crew Dragon vehicle has flown Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley for their lengthy stay at the International Space station, where it seemed initially that Boeing Starliner may at one point win the race to get astronauts to the International Space Station first. That clearly didn't happen. So yes, another very interesting week of space news there. Now a huge thank you to my amazing patrons here. I simply could not do what I'm doing here without you. Your generous support has allowed me to increase the time I can spend on this content, and I can't thank you all enough for that. Further help just allows me to do even more. And if you like what I do and would like to join our awesome patrons here, head to patreon.com slash Marcus House. You can interact with me more directly via the included Discord roles, you can check out some exclusive patron-only content, and you can also have your name listed right here like these other incredible people. So with that, a massive thank you as well to my Quality Control Squad here for helping me research and proof the material for these videos. If you're interested in these topics and would like to be part of this, follow me on Twitter and please do get in touch. In the tile in the bottom left today, we have my video last week talking about SpaceX's GPS-3 mission, along with some information of the Mars 2020 delay. In the top right is my latest video, in the bottom right, content that YouTube has selected from a channel just for you. Thank you everyone for watching, and we'll see you all in the next video.